good evening and a warm welcome to all the dignitaries present here. I'm Sreyoshi from Clarnet, serving as the allocated session assistant to ensure a seamless experience. So let's begin today's session for which I would like to invite Dr. Murali Dhar Kanchi sir to take over. Over to you sir, kindly proceed with the talk. Thank you so much Sreyoshi and welcome everyone for this wonderful ICA webinar. It's a hallmark of Indian College of Anesthesiologists been conducted for the last uh, over three years, three years, actually close to four years now. Every Wednesday, seven to nine is the time. And today's topic is issues in neuroanesthesia. We have uh, three eminent faculty to moderate the session. They will also be sort of panelists at the end of the session. Dr. Bhadrin Narayan is the professor of neuroanesthesia at the prestigious National Institute of Mental Science and Neurosciences. And Dr. Raghavendra Pai is the lead consultant, master CMI, very well skilled and uh, knowledgeable in the field of neuroanesthesia. And thirdly, we have Dr. Sanjay Banakal, who works for the Mazumdar Shah Medical Center in Narayana Hill City. And he's again a very well experienced and knowledgeable person in the subject of neuroanesthesiologists. With these few interactive words, I would like to welcome all of you. And uh, we are uh, privileged to have Dr. Uh, Kumar Bilani today uh, from USA joining us. And also Dr. S Sunil Purboni from Gulf is joining us today. And I'm looking forward to an interesting presentation and interaction. With that, I would like to request Dr. Padina Ryan to open the session by inviting Dr. Amit Mishra. Uh, Amit Mishra will be talking about control of ICP. Dr. Badri, please uh, proceed with the proceedings. Uh, good evening, everybody. Yeah. And welcome to the session. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting topic that we have and very useful at the bedside. We have today Dr. Mishra who will be speaking to us on ICP. And he will be telling us uh, more in detail about the ICP, the various modalities, and where it will be useful to us in the practice of neuroanesthesia. Over to you, Dr. Mira. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my topic for today is uh, control of ICP, uh, brain relaxation. Coming to the uh, normal physiology, the skull or the cranium is a rigid structure with a fixed space uh, carrying the brain tissue, the CSF, and the blood. So uh, the CSF and the uh, CSF is a clear fluid in the subarachnoid space and the ventricles uh, that cushions the brain and the spinal cord. Coming to the intracranial pressure, it is the total pressure that is exerted by the brain, blood, and the CSF in the intracranial vault. Any increase in the brain volume or the cerebral blood flow or the CSF volume can lead to the raised ICP. Uh, the monroe kelly doctrine, it states that the contents of the cranium are in a state of constant volume that is total volumes of the brain tissue that uh, uh, amounts to 80% and CSF 10% and intracranial blood 10% are fixed. And that an increase in any one of these must be offset by an equal decrease in the another or else the intracranial pressure will increase. Uh, coming to the uh, graph, the cerebral volume pressure curve showing the relationship between the ICP and an increase in the intracranial component volume. So this graph shows the compensated phase as well as the decompensated phase. The compensated phase is where the cerebral autoregulation is working. And, uh, and the decompensated phase where the cerebral autoregulation fails and there is a steep rise in ICP. The normal values of the ICP, they are 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury for adults and older children, three to seven millimeters of mercury for the young children, and 1.5 to six millimeters of mercury for the term infants. ICP values greater than 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury require treatment. Sustained ICP values of greater than 40 mm of mercury indicate a life, uh, severe life-threatening intracranial hypertension that has to be treated. Coming to the cerebral autoregulation, the process by which the cerebral blood flow varies to maintain the adequate cerebral perfusion. The cerebral perfusion pressure is a major factor that affects the cerebral blood flow to the brain. It is measured in millimeters of mercury. The cerebral perfusion pressure is used as an important clinical indicator of cerebral blood flow and hence adequate oxygenation. When the mean arterial pressure is elevated, the vasoconstriction occurs in the brain to limit the blood flow and maintain a cerebral perfusion. 
when the patient is hypotensive or in shock the cerebral vasculature can dilate to increase the blood flow and maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure uh, some formulas like C cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to mean arterial pressure minus icp and it can be calculated as a cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to mean arterial pressure minus cvp this is the cerebral autoregulation graph showing the maintenance of the cerebral blood flow by autoregulation typically occurs within a mean arterial pressure range of 60 to 150 millimeters of mercury. Uh, coming to the causes of raised ICP, there are various causes of raised ICP. First is the diffuse brain edema due to the diffuse head injury, encephalitis, meningitis, seizures, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, encephalopathy, maybe hepatic, septic or uremic and stroke. The focal brain edema, that is a localized mass lesion, may be traumatic hematomas, extradural, subdural, or intracerebral. Brain neoplasms like gliomas, meningiomas, metastasis, brain abscess, ischemic, or hemorrhagic stroke. The disturbance of CSF circulation may be because of obstructive hydrocephalus, communicating hydrocephalus, and choroid plexus tumor. Obstruction to the major venous sinuses, the cerebral venous thrombosis, the depressed fractures overlying the major venous sinuses, vascular malformations, these are arteriovenous malformations idiopathic that is benign intracranial hypertension the signs and symptoms which the patient comes with the raised icp they, they complain of headaches nausea and vomiting maybe irritability hypertension bradycardia irregular respiration decreased mental abilities may have confusion drowsiness the pupils not reacting to light or unequal pupils visual changes they complain of visual changes the blurred vision double vision photophobia and uh, maybe because of the optic disc edema optic atrophy the loss of consciousness and finally maybe leading to coma as the pressure worsens then there is a cushing stride the cushing stride is uh, mainly recognized by the uh, the increase in the intracranial pressure it shows um, hypertension bradycardia and irregular respiration these this is again a slide showing the increased intracranial pressure what the adults uh, and the infants come with uh, the, mainly the symptoms are uh, papillary edema, uh, pupillary changes are there, posturing may be decerebrate or decorticate posture in the adults. They may complain of headache and vomiting, changes in the speech, the seizures may be there. For infants, they can come with the, with the raised ICP, they can come with the bulging fontanelles, the cranial suture separation, increased head circumference, high-pitched cry. They can have prominent scalp veins, the bossing of the forehead and the sunset eyes, the characteristic of hydrocephalus, shrill cry. Lethargy, the child may be irritable and uh, separated suture lines may be there, enlarged fontanelles, bulging fontanelles, and increased head circumference. This is the management of the raised ICP. It is a stepwise approach for the management of the raised ICP, that is tier zero, starting from tier zero to tier one, tier two, and tier three. The general management or the tier zero. The first is the resuscitation, that is the maintenance of the airway, breathing, and circulation. It prevents hypoxia, hypercapnia, and hypotension. The airway, the early intubation, if uh, the early intubation is required, if the GCS, GCS is less than eight, evidence of herniation is there, apnea, or inability to maintain the airway. To maintain adequate oxygenation, the hypoxia can increase the ICP by vasodilatation and cerebral edema. The cuffing and bucking during the laryngoscopy and intubation can also increase the ICP, so sedatives should always be used. Uh, drugs like esmolol, labetalol, or lignocaine can also be used to blunt the hemodynamic responses to laryngoscopy. The ventilation, hypercarbia causes cerebral vasodilatation. It causes increase in the cerebral blood volume and ICP. Hypoventilation is to be avoided. Blood pressure, hypotension reduces the cerebral uh, perfusion pressure in a brain with the impaired autoregulation. So the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, they recommend a systolic blood pressure of greater than or equal to 100 millimeters of mercury for a patient of the age of 50 to 69 years old. And a systolic blood pressure uh, equal to uh, greater than or equal to 110 millimeters of mercury for a patient from 15 years to 49 years or greater than 70 years of old, uh, 70 years of age to reduce the mortality and to improve the outcome. In the cases of circulatory failure, the fluid bolus can be given, but uh, hypotonic fluids should be avoided. The elevated BP is commonly seen in patients with raised ICP that is just a compensatory mechanism to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure. The systemic hypertension usually resolves with sedation. The beta blockers, labetalol, esmolol, or centrally acting alpha agonist clonidine can be used. The vasodilating drugs like nitroglycerin or, and nitroprusside should be avoided as they can increase the ICP. The cerebral perfusion pressure, the Brain Trauma Foundation recommends the target cerebral perfusion pressure value for survival and favorable outcome between uh, 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury. 
sedation and analgesia. It prevents coughing, uh, bucking, and agitation. It facilitates the mechanical ventilation and suctioning. It enables the seizure control. It exerts cerebral protective effects by reducing the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption and cerebral blood flow. The propofol, midazolam, and dexmedetomidine can be used for sedation. They can be adequately supplemented with analgesics like fentanyl. Facilitation of cerebral venous drainage. The head end of the bed should be elevated at 15 to 30 degree with the head in the neutral position. This enhances the cerebral venous drainage and it promotes the circulation of CSF from the intracranial to the spinal compartment. Any ET tube ties or any cervical collars may need to be adjusted, that is to prevent any compression on the internal jugular vein. The fever control, the fever increases the metabolic rate by 10 to 13% per degree Celsius and is a potent vasodilator. It increases the ICP. The fever should always be controlled with the antipyretics and hydrotherapy. The glucocorticoids, the neurological deficit that is secondary to vasogenic edema due to brain tumor, abscess, or any non-infectious neuroinflammations respond well to uh, steroid use. The raised ICP reduces over a period of two to five days. IV dexamethasone is used at a dose of four milligram to eight milligram every six hourly, uh, six to eight hourly. And steroids are contraindicated in treating the raised ICPs or uh, for improving the outcome secondary to the traumatic brain injury or the spontaneous hemorrhage. Neuroimaging, when a, a non-contrast CT scan head should be done when the patient is stable after the uh, tier zero and can be transported safety, uh, safely after the tier zero uh, management. The contrast study helps in the identification of uh, abscesses and tumors. The CT scan, if the CT scan is normal, and the patient has features of raised ICP, then an MRI or with the MR venogram can be done. It can pick up early stroke as well as venous thrombosis. Now, these are the pictures of the CT scan showing the normal as well as the elevated ICP. The differentiation of the gray matter and the white matter is lost um, in the cases of the elevated ICP. This is the midline shift of the brain. This is the CT scan showing the uh, midline shift of the brain. The tier one specific therapy, the osmotic therapy, the hyperosmolar therapy is the mainstay of the treatment of the raised ICP. It creates osmotic gradient across the blood and draws the fluid intravascularly and reduces the cerebral edema. The, uh, the first and the most thing, important uh, thing is used is mannitol, used in the doses of 0.25 to 1 gram per kg body weight, followed by 0.25 to 0.5 gram per kg boluses, repeated every four to six hours. Can be given in the peripheral line, the doses greater than 200 gram per day can cause acute renal failure. Serum osmolarity should be monitored and kept below 320 milliosmoles per kg. The mannitol lowers the ICP 1 to 5 minutes after IV administration. The peak effect is at 40 minutes. The duration of the effect is 90 minutes to 6 hours. Attention should be uh, paid to the fluid balance and uh, to avoid hypovolemia and shock in the patients while using mannitol. Side effects of mannitol are hypotension, rebound increase in ICP, electrolyte imbalance, dehydration, and renal failure. The second agent which is used in the, uh, this therapy is hypertonic saline. It is available in the concentrations ranging from 3%, 5%, 7.5% 7 to 23.4%. Remains within the vascular compartment longer than mannitol. It is used to reduce the cerebral edema in patients who are hypovolemic or hypotensive. It is preferred in patients with a renal failure. Can be used to treat hyponatremia, which untreated can worsen the brain edema. Given as a bolus dosing, the 3% hypertonic saline is given as 2.5 to 5 ml per kg over 5 to 10, 20 minutes and 5% at 2.5 to 5 ml per kg over 5 to 20 minutes. The continuous infusion at uh, 0 0.1 to 1 ml per kg per hour to target a serum sodium level of uh, 145 to 155 milliequivalents per liter. The central line access is recommended for uh, giving hypertonic saline. The duration of the effect is 90 minutes to 4 hours. The serum sodium and the neurological status needs to be closely monitored when the patient is on the hypertonic saline therapy and it can be used up to seven days. The side effects are hypernatremia, hypochloremic metabolic acidosis. The tier two uh, therapy, the approach, if the ICP is not controlled with the tier one medical therapy, consider decompressive surgical options. If the patient is not fit for surgery, then other uh, tier two interventions should be applied. The sedation depth can also be increased uh, using the agents like propofol, uh, the resection of the mass lesions um, done to reduce the ICP as a definitive therapy for the lesions. The abscesses must be drained. The acute epidural, epidural and subdural hematoma should be evacuated. The resection of the intracerebral lesion or the brain parenchyma also aid in decompression. The CSF drainage by the external ventricular drain lowers the ICP immediately by reducing the intracranial volume. 
the continuous drainage of csf uh, by an evd zeroed at the level of the midbrain 5 to 10 centimeters above the external artery meatus uh, may be more beneficial in reducing the icp than intermittent drainage the decompressive craniectomy involves the removal of a portion of the skull vault it reduces the icp immediately done in the patients with diffuse cerebral swelling due due to uh, traumatic brain injury stroke with the brain edema and non infectious neuro inflammatory conditions a large fronto temporoparietal uh, decompressive craniectomy not less than 12 by 15 cm or 15 cm diameter is recommended over a small fronto temporoparietal craniectomy for reduced mortality and improved neurologic outcomes in the patients with a severe traumatic brain injury. The complications include uh, hydrocephalus and hemorrhagic swelling ipsilateral to the craniectomy site. Hyperventilation. It is a temporary measure for reducing the raised ICP in acute neurologic deterioration or the cases of the cerebral herniation. Its effect is immediate but lasts for only four to six hours, after which the pH of the CSF rapidly equilibrates to the new PaCO2 levels. As the CSF pH equilibrates, the cerebral arterioles they begin to dilate again. The target PaCO2 should be 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury. Prolonged prophylactic hyperventilation with the PaCO2 of less than 25 millimeters of mercury is not recommended by the Brain Trauma Foundation as it increases the risk of cerebral ischemia. The contraindications for hyperventilation are should not be used as a prophylactic measure. It should not be used for the first 24 hours of severe traumatic brain injury when the cerebral blood flow is often reduced critically and there are more chances of uh, cerebral ischemia for prolonged periods uh, four to six hours without brain oxygenation monitoring and should not stop suddenly because there is a risk of rebound raised icp and caesar therapy the caesar activity will increase the cerebral metabolic rate and the cerebral blood flow the cerebral blood flow in excess of tissue demand leads to raised icp the latest brain trauma foundation guidelines have recommended benetoin to decrease the incidence of early post-traumatic seizures within the seven days of injury Tier 3. Uh, these are the most aggressive measures to reduce ICP with the most serious adverse effects. So used in refractory cases, the barbiturate coma, it reduces the intracranial pressure. The mechanism for reduction in ICP is probably the result of a coupled reduction in cerebral blood flow and the cerebral metabolic rate. The pentobarbital is not preferred as it causes hypotension and the, require, and the requirement may be of the vasopressor support. Hyopentone is commonly used given in a loading dose of 5 mg per kg over 30 minutes followed by an infusion of 1 to 5 mg per kg hour until the EEG shows the burst suppression pattern. The BP is to be monitored as the hypotension can occur. The complications are hypotension, hypokalemia, respiratory depression, hepatic and renal dysfunction. The therapeutic hypothermia, it reduces the cerebral metabolic rate. It reduces the basal component of cellular metabolism along with the suppression of electrical activity of the brain. The evidence for benefit is stronger for post-cardiac arrests, patients, and for the neonatal hypoxic ischemia. The predictable decrease in ICP with the use of moderate hypothermia, the target core temperature is 32 to 34 degrees Celsius. The adverse effects are shivering, cardiac arrhythmias, and electrolyte disturbances. The rewarming should be done very slowly to avoid the rebound severe intracranial hypertension. So uh, the timely recognition and the management of the raised ICP improves the patient outcome when performed in a stepwise manner and the increasing aggressiveness. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Mishra, for that presentation. So shall we take the questions now or shall we do it at the end of the time? The questions may be at the end of all the three presentations. Okay. So I now request Dr. Raghinder Pai to introduce, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Sweta Reddy. After that uh, interesting and detailed talk about intracranial uh, pressure, the second topic is uh, venous air embolism. The speaker is uh, Dr. Shweta N. Reddy, who is a consultant anesthesia in Narayana Health City. I request Dr. Shweta to start the presentation. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Today, I'll be discussing about uh, venous air embolism. Now, the significant uh, mortality and morbidity that's associated with uh, venous air embolism, it's therefore very important for anesthetists to have an awareness of uh, risk factors, the clinical features, 
uh, means to identify them and to treat them. So venous air embolism is uh, any abnormal collection of gas that forms a bubble in the systemic venous circulation. So this bubble can act as an embolus and cause uh, partial or total occlusion of uh, blood flow. Most cases are iatrogenic and subclinical. When I say iatrogenic, it is uh, any procedure that exposes the venous system to the surrounding gas or air. So these carries a risk of uh, venous air embolism. Among the procedures that we do, the most common is during uh, central venous uh, cannulation. When we failure, when there's a failure to occlude the hub or when there's detachment of uh, catheter connections or when the patient takes a deep inspiration during uh, insertion or removal, especially in the setting of uh, hypovolemia. And when I say subclinical, it means that most cases are benign and there's no obvious symptoms that are there. Uh, they, I mean, they're not even reported. However, when they develop, it's important to treat them and they definitely need a prompt action. So air embolism can be venous, arterial or paradoxical air embolism. So there has to be a source of gas, the communication between the vessels and the source of gas and the pressure gradient or when an operative site is higher than that of the right atrium. Now, this exact incidence is not known, but uh, definitely the incidence is increasing because of uh, increase in invasive procedures. And uh, our better monitoring has also led to increase in detection. Among all the procedures that we do, the neurosurgery uh, pro surgical procedures have the highest risk. So there's almost 100% risk with uh, seated craniotomies, about 40% risk with uh, C-sections, and uh, increasing risk with uh, hip arthroplasties, and also anterior uh, cervical discectomies. Now to produce symptoms, about five ml per kg of air has to be introduced, but even about one to two ml of air into the CNS or even 0.5 ml of air into the coronaries can be fatal. Now about 100 to 300 ml is definitely fatal because it's gonna cause an air lock. Now this volume is relevant because uh, there, if there is a five centimeter pressure gradient via a 14 gauge cannula, we can entrain about 100 ml of air per second. So that can be most definitely uh, fatal. Now coming to the pathophysiology. Now uh, the severity of symptoms almost, uh, you know, they depend on the volume of gas that is entrained or the rate of entrainment. Now once air is entered into the uh, venous system, it will either come to the right atrium or the right ventricle here and locks it. And then it can cause three main effects. So the first one is when there's a large bolus of air that is entrained, it causes an air lock and uh, right ventricular outflow tract is obstructed and there is a sudden cardiovascular collapse. So this is one of the worst kinds. Now, small amount of air can be broken down by the capillary system and there's no sequelae. A slower infusions will trap uh, air at the level of pulmonary circulation. And uh, this causes increase in uh, pulmonary artery pressure and increased uh, right ventricular pressure. And uh, this can cause uh, you know, increased ventilation perfusion mismatch. Now, the other effect of uh, slow entrainment is that it can cause an immunological reactions, meaning uh, neutrophils can be attracted to the bubble and it can cause increased in uh, the permeability and then this causes pulmonary edema, thereby uh, causing bronchospasm and increased uh, airway resistance. Now, until recently, there's another way where it can lodge into the left ventricle, that is, uh, until recently, it was thought that about 27% uh, of the patient had uh, patent foramen ovale and there might be a, you know, shunting of the, I mean, there's right to left shunt. So uh, the air can get deposited in the left side of the heart. But in addition to that, there is also a very significant transpulmonary shunting that can also lodge the air into the left side of the heart. In either case, these can disrupt the coronary circulation and uh, this can cause uh, you know, hypoxia and hypercapnia, and there's a lot of pressure that builds up in the heart, especially with the transpulmonary shunting. What happens is that there's significant pressure that uh, builds up on the right side of the heart, and thereby they're shunting into the left side of the heart. So these three can be the main uh, pathophysiological sequelae. There's also some stress on air embolism syndrome. Now, with various case reports, we know that, uh, you know, uh, air embolism can also result in a uh, systemic severe inflammatory response syndrome with a subsequent multi-organ dysfunction. Now, two theories have been proposed for that. One is the microvascular occlusion theory. That is, a small bubbles can cause microvascular occlusion, resulting in a subsequent tissue ischemia and inflammation. But this does not account for why uh, a seemingly smaller volume uh, entrainments can cause a severe reaction. For that, they have come up with a gene environment mismatch theory. 
that is the gas that are uh, produ gas producing pathogens can trigger the innate immunity of the patient and this can promote platelet aggregation and severe systemic inflammation for both cases the management is organ specific uh, supportive strategies in the icu we'll have to know a bit about the risk factors that is uh, uh, that can preclude to air embolism the most common like i said was a seated craniotomy uh, surgeries that is a fowler's position this is the classic at risk setting for a venous air embolism there are two main causes here the first thing is that uh, now in uh, in the brain we have something called as sinuses as opposed to vessels so these are non compressed uh, venous systems that are present in addition to that when we uh, keep the patient in a seated position the pressure gradient gradually i mean this drastically increases so these two uh, conditions are mainly uh, at risk for uh, the risk uh, the venous air embolism so there's more risk during posterior fossa surgeries or spinal surgeries or shoulder surgeries by sheer presence of the you know surgical site above the level of the heart now during laparoscopic surgeries we can have carbon dioxide embolism during uh, insufflation and uh, even in the cesarean section procedures we might have it due especially during uh, exteriorization of the uterus now our own procedures like central venous access or when we give any pressurized infusions which are non primed or unrecognized epidural veil cannulation can cause uh, the venous air embolism and even blunt and penetrating trauma especially in the setting of hypovolemia can also uh, risk the patient uh, for the embolism i also just mentioned this arterial uh, embolism risk factors just for completion sake now the clinical findings especially in awake patients uh, mainly the temporal relation that's between the symptoms and uh, invasive procedure should give us the biggest clue to diagnosis so in any patient who's had a invasive procedure we may have to keep this as a differential diagnosis in mind awake patients may complain of dyspnea tachypnea they may have wheeze and rails and also substernal chest pain which can go on to hypotension and tachycardia we might also uh, recognize a milveal murmur but this often the late stages like the heart failure patient might have a sense of doom and dizziness and lightheadedness there might be a focal neurological deficit as well and there might be crepitus over the superficial vessels and if we do an ophthalmology examination we can see bubbles within the retinal arteries now uh, in a in a condition like this we need to know the differential diagnosis as well mostly all these conditions require prompt treatment so we have to diagnose differentially up in this uh, like setting as uh, ischemia or infarction or other phase, uh, conditions of causes of uh, cardiogenic shock or failure there may be hemorrhage or hypovolemia or arrhythmia we should also differentiate it between an embolism that is a pulmonary embolism or a pneumothorax or a pulmonary edema so hemorrhagic stroke or seizures can also mimic this condition as is sepsis and uh, anaphylaxis now so with all these conditions it becomes very important to detect now the clinical condition uh, clinical indicators are generally late so all the monitors that we use should have a high level of uh, sensitivity and specificity for prompt recognition and they should also give us a chance for uh, rapid response and if possible quantitatively measure the venous air embolism and it could indicate us the course of recovery from the event as well so we have different uh, we have uh, classified this into non invasive and the invasive monitoring now in the non invasive monitoring like i said the physiological signs are relatively uh, you know a later stages and they are not sensitive or specific now among the non invasive monitors the combination of end tidal capno and the precordial doppler will provides us with optimum combination of uh, sensitivity and affordability now vtco2 is what we commonly use during every procedure readily available and they are fairly sensitive this can detect about 0.5 ml of uh, i mean 0.5 ml per kg of air but again it's not specific to air and it is uh, definitely affected by perfusion pressures and the respiratory pathology so even entidal nitrogen can be as specific as entidal carbon dioxide but it's expensive and we don't readily use it a uh, precordial doppler is far more sensitive than these two because it can detect about uh, 0.05 ml per kg of air that's about 10 times as sensitive and it's easy to position as well but uh, precordial doppler is affected by uh, obesity and uh, there can be interference of diathermy we can affect the readings and uh, there's no indication of volume of air that is entering and there's also a potential obscure uh, readings by ambient noise and it requires more vigilance now transcranial doppler is as uh, sensitive or specific as a precordial doppler because it can detect about 0.05 ml as well 
and it can also be detect uh, used to detect the shunting with agitated saline that is a preoperatively itself so we can diagnose uh, patent for aminol vein pre op but here the, there's a learning curve and it takes time to get used to this uh, monitor we also have a precordial stethoscope not very uh, sensitive or specific but uh, it can be used as well now among the invasive monitors the most uh, sensitive one is uh, transesophageal echo it can detect about 0.02 ml per kg of air so it's got an excellent sensitivity it can also quantify the size of an embolus because we would be seeing it real time and the uh, gold standard for the detection of uh, patent foramen ovale now this is difficult uh, using this modality it's difficult to differentiate an air, a flat or a clot there's limited availability because this also has a learning curve and it's expensive and with this monitor there's always a risk of uh, esophageal injury so we also have an esophageal stethoscope and pulmonary artery catheter both of them are not very commonly used and they are, really don't have any added advantage over this central venous cannula is always uh, better to be used because uh, it can also give us uh, or one modality to aspirate the air if needed now this is just to summarize uh, what i said about uh, the the monitoring so echo is the most uh, sensitive and specific compared to the others and then uh, the clinical uh, changes are uh, fairly late in the diagnosis so this is a transesophageal echo image which shows uh, you know air bubbles in the right atrium and the mediesophageal uh, bicaval view we can see these bubbles here so this can be easily quantified as well we also have this uh, imaging where you can see the bubbles uh, real time here and so there's continuous entrainment of bubbles here in the transesophageal echo so considering the condition uh, the most effective strategy is to prevent uh, venous air embolism no so for prevention we should be extra vigilant during surgery especially in the prone or the sitting positions or during insufflation during hysteroscopies we can identify the at risk patients you know by pre op screen so uh, we can do a pfo screen the excellent bedside test is to do a transcranial doppler and see a tiny bubbles in the middle cerebral artery following injection of agitated saline solutions so these patients you it's better to just avoid the seated craniotomies altogether or have caution at least and uh, then we can also have strategies to elevate uh, right atrial and the central venous pressure with adequate hydration provided uh, the patient's cardiac status is permitting and we can do jugular venous compression as in we can ask a surgeon to give a jugular venous compression during uh, periods of higher risk and we can use uh, military anti -sh uh, shock trousers that is to proper vapim of uh, lower extremities uh, to elevate the venous pressure and also we can focus on meticulous surgical dis uh, dissection that is using of bone wax when there are more uh, exposure and that and keep 100% oxygen during this um, high uh, in, um, high risk uh, part of the surgery now use of peep is very controversial ideally uh, raising cvp through the use of peep uh, thereby minimizing the risk seems logical but again uh, very high level of peep are needed to elevate the right atrial pressure and also peep may have an exaggerated effect on reducing the preload so that can be counterproductive so because of this uh, entry uh, because of increased intrathoracic pressure that is and also once we release the preep that itself can risk uh, re uh, raised uh, entrainment increased rate of entrainment so coming to the management see most of the management is supportive and there are three main strategies one is immediate resuscitation second one is to prevent further entrainment of air or third one is to effort uh, uh, the efforts to halt or remove the air that has been entrained so the first one is immediate resuscitation that uh, whenever there is a crisis the first thing is to focus on the abc approach that is if the airway is not secure secure the airway or uh, that is if the patient is seated make the patient back in supine position or the lateral decubitus position if there is intention to aspirate the air use 100% oxygen because it corrects not only corrects hypoxia but also reduces the size of the bubble because of the diffusion gradient allowing the nitrous to nitrogen to leave the bubble and uh, if the patient collapses at any point of time we'll have to get on to the acls algorithm and progress accordingly now we can uh, prevent the um, further entrainment of air by flooding the operative site by using saline or you know compressing the wound edges also elevate uh, venous pressure uh, by uh, giving i mean reducing the head end volume loading compressing the major vessels uh, like jugular venous uh, compression if you are using a laparoscopy um, immediately discontinue the insufflation of air or stop any process which can entrain air like bone reaming and all those during ortho procedures 
just stop that or halt it for a while and uh, to rem if there is an effort to uh, remove the entrained air a specific anesthetist has to be you know in charge of it a senior person preferably put the patient in uh, left lateral decubitus position and uh, try to remove the air now uh, by putting the patient in uh, the left lateral decubitus or the durance position uh, this will trap the emboli in the right heart away from the main outlet for removal but uh, emergency placement of uh, central venous uh, line for this uh, particular uh, solution has not been uh, proven now while using a central venous line if it's a multi orifice catheter it has to be placed at least 2 cm below the svc and the ra junction and if it's a single orifice catheter it has to be placed 3 cm proximal to it so this is the durance position which is the left uh, lateral position with a slight head down now, I have come across some articles of which uh, one, uh, this one, uh, this temporal insular glioma case report is quite interesting because all through we have been told that uh, only when there is a, you know, a non-compressible venous system and in a sitting position, this is what is seen. But this is a case of a young patient, about 23 year old, where he had a tumor in the insular cortex. Now, this is called as the island of Ryle. It is quite deep seated. It is not very exposed to the atmosphere. And yet, this patient uh, had a, a significant uh, venous air embolism with uh, a, a drastic reduction in ETCO2 and blood pressure fall during surgery. But it was uh, promptly evac. Uh, the air was promptly removed from the center using a central line, and immediately all the vitals came back to normal, and uh, the surgery was continued. Patient was also extubated uh, about five hours after the surgery without any neurological sequelae. So we can have this complication across all the uh, patient age groups. This was a very uh, young patient. The next one is an old patient, 86 year old. Here it was, uh, she was actually treated for uh, cholangitis and pancreatitis and then lab cholae was done about three days later. And uh, on post-op day two, she developed uh, all these dyspnea and tachypnea and incidentally the CT found that uh, they had a she had a uh, air embolism at the pulmonary vasculature. Now, the, similarly, there's another case of a 72-year-old male who was also misdiagnosed to have uh, TIA and he was uh, almost getting treated for an uh, impending stroke, but uh, then they found out uh, the CT scan uh, had uh, showed uh, evidence of uh, air embolism. So air embolism has to be included as a differential diagnosis in a patient who's had at least a recent surgery or recent trauma or any chances of uh, recent uh, cannulation in the near uh, in the last uh, couple of days and sudden development of symptoms this uh, thank you for this Uh, thank you, Dr. Swetharki, for that excellent presentation of venous air embolism, the causative factors and the detection and treatment. Thank you so much. And we thank will you, uh, now go on to the next topic. For that, I request Dr. Sanjay Banakal to take over and introduce him, Dr. Yupati, and then we will go to the third topic regarding neurologic monitoring. Good evening, Sanjay uh, Banakal, thank you, please. Dr. Uh, may I now invite uh, Dr. Indumati T to speak on this topic of neurological monitoring. Dr. Indumati is a consultant anesthesiologist at the Mazumda Shaw Medical Center, Narana Health at Bangalore. She has over 10 years of, uh, more than 10 years of experience in the field of uh, anesthesiology. And uh, I now invite Dr. Indumati to speak on neurological monitoring. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. I'll be talking regarding the neurologic monitoring. Neurologic monitoring can be classified into two types, mainly based on assessment of adequacy of cerebral perfusion or the assessment of neurophysiologic function. The adequacy of cerebral perfusion can be assessed by either the cerebral blood flow or the oxygen delivery. Perfusion-based monitors are further divided into non-invasive and invasive monitors. The non-invasive monitors include tracer-based perfusion monitoring, transcranial Doppler ultrasound, jugular bulb oxygen saturation, and cerebral oximetry. Invasive monitors include the brain tissue oxygen partial pressure, the thermal diffusion blood flow measurement, and the laser Doppler measurement. Coming to the individual uh, uh, modalities of perfusion-based monitoring, the tracer-based perfusion monitoring 
This is a, a non-invasive monitor based on the amount of the inert tracer, which is washed in and out of the brain. Uh, and it is captured by the CT or MRI imaging. The main limitation here is that it is time restricted. There can be, uh, cannot be a continuous uh, imaging done uh, to assess the cerebral blood flow. So here you can see um, this is a post uh, M left MCA stroke, wherein uh, there is uh, occlusion of the left middle cerebral artery. And these are the images which indicate uh, the regional blood flow, regional blood volume, and the time for peak of the contrast or the inert material. So you can see that the warm colors, that is the red and yellow colors, indicate uh, the cerebral perfusion. So the flow and volume are symmetrical bilaterally, whereas in this uh, image, you can see there is a delay in the time to peak drastically on the right hemisphere because of an infarct. Coming to the transcranial Doppler ultrasound, it's a continuous non-invasive monitor uh, which measures the blood flow velocity using ultrasound in the large arteries uh, like the middle cerebral arteries. There are four approaches. Um, uh, it is uh, transtemporal, transorbital, transoccipital, and transforaminal. It detects uh, embolic episodes, decreased flow across the vessel, or narrowing of the vessels. Um, and in uh, case of surgeries like carotid endarterectomy, it can even detect shunt occlusion. And in arch, aortic arch surgeries, the malposition of the shunts. It also gives the pulsatility index, which correlates well with the cerebral vascular resistance, um, indicated in case of a traumatic brain injury. The only limitation is thickness of the bone, bone around which around the acoustic window. Coming to jugular bulb venous oxygen saturation, uh, this is again a non-invasive perfusion monitor, which represents the balance between the supply and demand. It assesses oxygen consumption uh, of the brain. So here, uh, the normal values are around 55 to 75%. It is measured by placing a catheter in, a catheter in the jugular bulb uh, by using the fluoroscopic guidance, as you can see in the image. Cerebral oximetry, it's also called as near-infrared spectroscopy. It uses reflectance oximetry to measure the saturation of the tissue underneath the sensors. So this is how the sensors uh, look. They are applied on, bilaterally on the frontoparietal regions. Um, and uh, uh, only limitation is that uh, the local values uh, are extrapolated to represent the global cerebral blood flow. It, uh, the normal values are around 60% to 75%. Invasive monitors of cerebral perfusion, uh, these include tissue partial pressure of oxygen monitoring, uh, it is basically influenced by the arterial oxygen content and also the perfusion to the brain and the thermal diffusion flowmetry. In this method, as, uh, thermistor and sensor are placed uh, in the brain tissue and the temperature difference between the two is assessed as uh, the uh, indirect measure of uh, cerebral perfusion. Then we have the laser Doppler flowmetry. Again, it is an inexpensive uh, method. The main limitation here is uh, because of the invasive nature, it carries 1 to 2% risk of infection, bleeding, ischemia, and uh, there is a limited spatial resolution only around the probe, and uh, they are all under experiment experimental stages for application. Coming to the recent advances, um, cerebral microdialysis is an invasive bedside neuromonitor that analyzes the biochemical markers from the cerebral dilate fluid. Uh, for the occurrence of ischemia, especially in case of traumatic brain injury. The increased ICP or decreased uh, cerebral perfusion pressure correlates well with the high lactate pyruvate ratio and is, it implies a worst outcome in traumatic brain injury. The other markers include glucose, lactate, pyruvate, and uh, neurotransmitters like glutamate, aspartate, and also uh, the tissue injury indices like glycerol and potassium. Coming to the second part of my topic, that is uh, intraoperative uh, neurophysiologic monitoring, IONM. It is a real-time monitoring of the nervous system that includes the brain, spine, and the nerves during surgery, positioning, or any critical event that can cause neural injury. It is important in order to avoid any permanent neurological injury during surgery. This informs the integrity of the neuronal pathway or structures. So how is it done? So in this various uh, electrodes, like we can see here, the pin electrodes and the screw electrodes, uh, which are uh, pass, uh, which are placed over the peripheral nerves or over the scalp. And uh, the, this is a specialized nerve monitoring tube, uh, which consists of a sensor. 
uh, which is placed at the level of the vocal cord to check on the recurrent laryngeal nerve manipulation. So here, electrical stimulus is given at one end of the neural pathway and it's measured uh, along the other end of the nerve pathway. So we have got the response. So when do we consider it as an alarm? This is how a simple response look. And uh, this is the answer. And latency is the distance uh, or the time between the onset of stimulus to the uh, onset of response. So warning sign is whenever there is a decrease in the amplitude of more than 50% or increase in the latency of more, uh, more than 10%. So in order to understand this, it's important to have a baseline monitoring prior positioning or surgery in order, uh, which will avoid any misinterpretation. Coming to modalities of IONM, somatosensory evoked potential, motor evoked potential, brainstem auditory evoked potential, visual evoked potential, electroencephalogram and electromyogram. The indications. So here is, I have uh, listed the indications along with the modalities used. So mainly for intracranial tumor resection, AV malformation, excision, vascular surgeries involving carotid endotectomy, head and neck surgeries, we use a somatosensory and motor evoc potential. In case of CP angle tumor, posterior cranial fossa tumors, and brainstem lesions, brainstem auditory evoc potential is used. Spine surgeries uh, use uh, uh, either the sensory motor evoc potential or uh, electromyography. Uh, nowadays, they are using multimodal monitoring uh, so that the spinal cord is covered anteroposteriorly. Then uh, the other indications include uh, use of electromyography for uh, monitoring of the uh, cranial nerves and spinal nerves when the surgeries are close to them, like in case of parotid surgery for facial nerve monitoring, thyroid surgery for rectal laryngeal nerve monitoring. EEG is used for uh, in case of carotid endotrectomy and cerebral aneurysm clipping. Coming to individual modalities, somatosensory evoke potential. This is most commonly used potential, which monitors the ascending sensory pathway or the dorsal column through transcutaneous electrical stimulation of the peripheral nerve. So once the nerve is stimulated, the impulse passes along the uh, ascending sensory pathway and uh, it relies, relays through the cervical medullary junction to the opposite uh, thalamus and then to the sensory cortex from where it is uh, responses are recorded. So basically in the upper limb, the median nerve and ulnar nerve are commonly stimulated and the lower limb is applied to the tibial nerve, posterior tibial nerve. So here in this image, we can see the somatosensory evoke potential, which is uh, 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 recorded for a case of aneurysm clipping. Uh, baseline is recorded, placement of uh, retractors and recovery is recorded. So after the retractors is placed, we can see that uh, there is dampening of the amplitude in the left cortex and it uh, recovers after removal of the retractor. So this is how the monitoring helps us. Coming to motor evoke potential, it monitors the descending corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts. The stimulation can either be uh, transcranial uh, electrical stimulation, TES, or direct stimulation on the brain. So here on stimulating, the impulses from the motor cortex pass along and relay in the anterior horn of the spinal cord or the cranial nerve nuclei. And from there, via the cranial nerve and peripheral nerve, it is relayed via the neuromuscular junction into the muscle causing contraction. Sometimes the impulses uh, or response can be recorded directly at the level of the spinal cord that is called as D waves or direct waves. It helps in detecting mechanical or ischemic injuries during major spine or intracranial surgeries. But the only limitation here is unlike SSCP, MEP is not continuous and there can be real, uh, risk of delayed detection. So this is how uh, uh, MEP response looks. Uh, these are all artifacts. Coming to brainstem auditory work potential, it is the acoustic stimulus uh, here is delivered uh, via a device, as you can see in this image, at the ear canal and the electric signals generated by the cochlea travel via the vestibular cochlea now to the brainstem. So this is used in CP angle tumors, posterior fossa tumors, brainstem uh, surgeries to assess a vascular or thermal injury of the neural tissue. Visual evoke potential, it's loosely used, but it measures the integrity of the optic pathway from the retina to the visual cortex in response to light stimulus. It is used in case of surgeries of the orbit, pituitary gland, and the optic nerve. Coming to electromyography, it can be of two types. That is a spontaneous free-running EMG or a triggered EMG. 
This free running um, uh, EMG records the normal uh, electrical activity from the muscle, which is usually of low frequency and amplitude. And in case of injury, it becomes a high frequency discharges. And triggered EMG is a stimulation of the cranial nerves or peripheral nerves, and the response is recorded in case of the uh, innervated muscles. For example, is the recurrent laryngeal nerve monitoring in thyroid surgeries, facial nerve monitoring in case of parotid surgery. So here you can see the nerve monitoring tube as we had seen earlier uh, with the sensor uh, placed at the level of the uh, pods. Used in neck dissection and in case of um, thyroid and parathyroid surgeries. And uh, this is the needle electrodes placed in uh, at the orbicularis oculi and oris. Uh, whenever the facial nerve is stimulated, the muscle contracts and produces response. This popcorn discharges are because of benign touch or irritation, and uh, any uh, significant injury can cause a response strain. And if there is any significant nerve ischemia injury, the neurotonic discharges are noted. Coming to an electroencephalogram, EEG, it is the electrical activity generated by the group of uh, pyramidal neurons of the cerebral cortex. It's highly sensitive to cerebral blood flow. There are uh, fast and slow waves like the alpha, beta, theta, and delta. They are mainly used in case of cerebral aneurysm clipping, carotid endotrachny, epilepsy surgeries, and also to monitor mainly the depth of anesthesia. So this image shows uh, the positioning of the uh, electrodes over the scalp, uh, 10 to 20 point system uh, at particular distances from the nasion to inion. It's also called as the cerebral montage. Coming to complications of intraoperative neuromonitoring. The main thing is bite injury. Uh, it can lead to tongue laceration, tooth breakage, endotracheal tube damage, especially if it's a flexometallic tube, can cause difficulty in ventilation. So it can be prevented by applying bite gag. So uh, silicone bite gags are available. Then movements during surgery, uh, if the depth is not maintained adequately and during stimulation, pain and seizures, tingling numbness at the needles, electrode sites post-operatively, and equipment malformation, malfunction, which can cause skin burns or seizures. Anesthesia for IONM, the best option uh, and most commonly followed is the total intravenous anesthesia especially when it is clubbed with uh, TCI pumps. Balanced anesthesia with inhalational agents and opioids can be used, especially we have to notice that the inhalational agent MAC value must be kept less than 0.5. Scalbox with conscious sedation is another modality in case of awake craniotomy. So what are the factors which can affect IONM? So any hyper or hypothermia, that is plus or minus two to 2.5 degrees Celsius uh, from the baseline temperature, can uh, dampen uh, uh, the uh, effect of uh, response, uh, amplitude or uh, latency. Then hypoxia, hypocapnia, that is PSU2 of less than 20 millimeter of mercury can cause vasoconstriction and uh, decrease the cerebral blood flow and thereby ischemia. And lower hematocrit less than 25, hypotension, especially when it starts going less than, uh, mean arterial pressure is less than 60, or uh, drugs, especially our anesthetic drugs. So there is, is uh, various uh, interactions between the drugs and uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring responses. Propofol at regular doses does not have much uh, response, but at higher doses uh, can uh, suppress the evoked potentials. Again, benzodiazepines and opioids uh, also have dose-dependent suppression of the response. Ketamine enhances the evoked potential responses, and Dexpem is the, there are not much uh, studies, but at higher doses, the MEP is lost. Volatile anesthetics have dose-dependent suppression of the evoked potential, especially when the MAC goes above 0.5. Muscle relaxant totally abolish the EMG and MEP. So in order to avoid overdosing, which causes suppression of response and underdosing, which can cause awareness and jerky movements, it's important to monitor the depth of anesthesia. These monitors of depth of anesthesia are basically based on EEG. We have the raw EEG, uh, BIS monitoring, entropy, patient state monitor or cerebral state monitor. So we have got a warning sign. So what do we do next? So the, it's a teamwork, clear communication should be initiated. Anesthesiologist uh, checks for oxygenation, ventilation levels, presence of any anemia, hypotension, hypo or hypothermia, and should also check if any bolus drug was given in between, like if any change of personnel handover is given, 
and uh, muscle relaxant was given uh, unknowingly or any bolus propofol or opioids were given. The neurophysiologist checks for the elect uh, electrodes, connections, uh, whether the um, uh, suppression of response was cranial or caudal to the level of manipulation. Usually caudal to the level of surgery indicates that it came, uh, the uh, warning sign is because of uh, surgery. Repeat the MEP and check, rule out any artifacts and check if it is acute or subacute. The neurosurgeon, first step is he must undo the previous step, like if any screw was placed, implant was placed, or um, uh, there was any retractor uh, causing pressure, it must be removed. I irrigation of the spinal cord with a warm saline to check on the local hypothermia. And lastly, uh, it is subjective. Some of them, uh, surgeons go for a wake-up test. So uh, post-operative management, we must plan for an early recovery and extubation to rule out any neurological deficit. So the main points to remember in case of INM is the goal is to preserve the integrity of sensory and motor system. Baseline monitoring prior to positioning is a must. Teamwork and clear communication is necessary. As an anesthesiologist, maintain oxygenation, ventilation, temperature, and uh, hematocrit, and plan for an early extubation and neurologic assessment. So these are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Indumati, for a nice talk on the neurological monitoring in anesthesia. Any questions on this topic can we have now? Yes, sir. Just let me, let me check. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to thank all the three speakers, Amit, Sweta, and Indumati for their excellent presentations. Thank you. Well done. Yes. And I would like to thank the moderation by Badri, Raghavendra, and Sanjay. Um, there is one question there. Should BIS or entropy must be used during uh, IOM is the question. Um, it is ideal if we are able to use uh, uh, depth of anesthesia monitoring uh, during IONM. Um, it depends upon uh, what availability we are having. So availability of BIS or entropy can be used. If we are able to interpret uh, raw EEG or even EEGs, uh, which is used in IONM, we can even utilize that. Thank you. Dr. Badri, would you like to comment on the presentations? And if you have anything extra to say, please uh, feel free. Yes, sir. Um, first, I would like to appreciate all the speakers for covering these topics well. Uh, the only thing I would like to add is with respect to ICP, uh, he could have uh, probably made a mention of the availability of monitors, right. and how useful they are at the bedside. And if they actually make any difference to the outcomes, even though the ICP monitoring uh, is done in many centers, even though it is uh, useful to manage the increase in the ICP, uh, it has been shown that uh, it may not uh, reflect very well in the outcomes or make any difference in the outcomes. So, even though the gold standard is invasive monitoring, a lot of focus is there on non-invasive monitors like uh, the optic nerve sheet diameter and right. PCD and yes. NIRS, which are available now uh, in many centers, so uh, or the pupillar battery for that uh, matter. Yes. Uh, so these can be used at the bedside for following trends instead of uh, having an infect uh, invasive monitor, which uh, is associated with some infective or hemorrhagic complications. Right. And uh, especially with IONM. Uh, it would be a good idea to have depth of anesthesia monitor because uh, we would be using infusions. So we would uh, have a good idea of the depth if we have uh, a base or an entropy monitor. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And thank you for your comments. Do you use uh, cerebral oximet in your day to day practice? And what are your indications, uh, Dr. Badri? Yeah, we have uh, NIRS available in the uh, ICU and uh, we are uh, use them in the OT also, especially when we are doing endotrectomies. Right. Uh, in the ICU, we use it especially when we are suspecting uh, elevated intracranial pressure. And we actually know if uh, the patient is responding to our treatment. 
Yes. Not only does it uh, reflect an increase in the perfusion pressure, uh, it gives an indirect parameter of uh, decrease in the ICP as a result of which the perfusion has increased. Right. right. Uh, and it's a real-time monitor, so it will enable us uh, to sustain that uh, so that uh, patients benefit from that and recover it. Even though it is expensive, uh, people who have it, uh, it's a good idea to use them uh, in uh, difficult to manage cases. Right, right. In uh, carotid endotractomies, what is the best monitor? Uh, what, according to you, what is the best one to choose uh, among these monitors? If we have a baseline monitor uh, with the NIRS, NIRS. Uh, once uh, reperfusion takes place, we will know if the uh, uh, oxidation is improving or not. If you can see an improvement in the oxidation, we, can, we know that. Uh, the re-established circulation is going to be useful for the patient. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Dr. Raghavinder Pai, your comments and anything you would like to add which is important? Regarding uh, monitoring during uh, uh, the last uh, talk, yes. what I would add is uh, during CP angle tumor surgeries, in addition to, you know, brainstem evoked uh, response, we will actively do facial nerve monitoring. Yes, yes. yes. So that, that will be basically a continuous monitoring, a ENMG during the procedure. So, uh, you know, that is one additional thing because see, ultimately at the end of the surgery, for most patients, Preservation of the facial nerve is essential. There is, those are the things, you know, it will be a concern uh, for yeah, anybody who has a CP angle tumor where the facial nerve is intact. So preservation of the facial nerve uh, is important. Yeah, right. Um, right. I would like to um, ask the, the speaker uh, what uh, anesthetic challenges uh, they would face during a interoperative uh, neuromonitoring because if for somebody who does routinely we do uh, face a lot of challenges because these days we have patients who have a lot of uh, comorbid uh, when they are present for surgery and it becomes uh, very challenging uh, you know when you are worried about having the patient up and fully awake to assess the neurological status Right. So, you know, it's a very challenging thing uh, when intraoperative neuromonitoring is uh, done. Of course, a lot of uh, things, uh, I mean, it, it is a teamwork when neuro, intraoperative neuromonitoring is done. And uh, the anesthesiologists, of course, it is possible only when they are on the same wavelength. Yes. The people also have to be on the same wavelength Absolutely. that uh, nothing is missed. And there is nothing like, you know, invariably, even in spite of taking all the precautions, uh, many a times uh, you do encounter uh, situations where uh, you are worried that, uh, you know, some injury has happened during the surgery, uh, which would be difficult to, you know, prove, disprove till the surgery is over. So, you know, that is one of the concerns. The best way is to have uh, a proper baseline value. And most important is you can't change the anesthesia technique during the procedure because right. it would affect the baseline and your right. recordings after that have to match. Otherwise, you will end up, you know, uh, having anxious moments. Uh, especially, you know, when the, it's a high-risk surgery on the spine, uh, you're always worried about uh, not adding to the problems. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Indimuga, do you want to respond about the challenges yeah, sir. in neurological monitoring? Yeah, sir. The basic uh, thing, uh, as a beginner, uh, what we faced was uh, we use muscle relaxant for intubation. And uh, to take the baseline monitor uh, immediately after, uh, before positioning and after positioning. So we have to wait for a period of time because uh, most often we don't use uh, saxamethonium chloride nowadays uh, in case of myopathies and because of the um, side effects it has. Um, so by the time they prepare and they are ready after catheterization and all those things, usually 
still be half an hour, uh, they're able to produce the response. That's one thing. Second thing is uh, regarding this uh, hypotension, uh, which is associated with uh, uh, giving continuously propofol and dexmedetomidin, um, uh, which uh, is another issue we are uh, uh, worried about because um, the, even hypotension can um, affect the responses. Uh, that is uh, one thing which commonly we uh, face. Um, and uh, recovery, though we expect uh, it should be early recovery with uh, long procedures and so much of Dexmed and Propofol with uh, fentanyl uh, infusions, um, uh, sometimes uh, if we do not uh, adequately cut uh, at the right time uh, before the closure and all those things, we can have a delayed recovery. Right. right. So, Dr. Indumati, yes, you sir. said the hypotension because of the use of... Uh, a proper fall. How do you manage uh, hypertension in your patients during intraoperative uh, neuromonitoring? Do you have a so, plan or do you anticipate, uh, you know, or you act only in those situations? Now, this is, uh, this is something, like you said, it is very common if you are not aware of what, uh, because one of the questions I saw was whether BIS or entropy is mandatory. I would say yes. Uh, it would be mandatory because you would not have an endpoint otherwise. Mm -hmm. You would have a patient unnecessarily deep. Uh, and one of the problems when you have the patient unnecessarily deep would be you would be invariably ending up causing hypertension to the patient. Yes. Uh, any plans of, uh, pre of uh, preventing hypertension or treating hypertension during intraoperative? So, uh, the plan is usually to maintain adequate uh, uh, volume and uh, if blood loss, replacement of the blood loss uh, and uh, norad infusions can be used um, to keep the pressures, uh, mean arterial pressure uh, above 65 or 70. So, this is how usually we target. And um, based on the availability, uh, BIS and entropy is used. Um, uh, the thing is like, uh, uh, though it is an up coming thing, it's still not made uh, mandatory to have a IUNM as per the ASA standard of monitoring or anything. But uh, we do know the advantages uh, right now that uh, having a, a patient with a CP angle tumor not using IUNM uh, will be a negligence, uh, though it's uh, not coming to standard of monitoring. Yes, we do use uh, intraoperative no monitoring routinely here. Uh, the challenges that you have mentioned, Dr. Pai mentioned, are uh, the ones which everybody faces, I think. The commonest uh, thing is uh, <clears throat> the patients are, uh, you know, IONM is used in uh, patients with uh, spine surgeries, especially for a cervical or a thoracic surgery. Patients are in the prone position. So invariably, we have that uh, hypotension in the uh, prone position, which is a common. So as he says, we should have a plan of action for uh, treating the hypotension, uh, though we may not be, you know, we are not using the uh, nerve, uh, I mean, anesthesia depth monitor, but we need to be aware that a patient should not be deep and uh, also make sure that the patient is well hydrated and the position is also properly maintained. There's no pressure on the abdomen or in the thoracic area. And also use, uh, you know, fluids and blood uh, as required and also increase the vasopressors. So the, I would say that the mean arterial pressure should be quite high in these patients because the cord compression uh, it can, you know, it can become ischemic very easily with a low mean arterial pressure. So we tend to use uh, more than uh, 80 millimeters mercury to be around uh, 100 millimeters mercury of uh, MAP in such cases. So that's the plan of action we usually have to mitigate the uh, hypotension. And also to prevent hypothermia, it's important because cold theaters can easily drop the temperature and uh, hypothermia itself can uh, interfere with the IONM monitoring. That's right. Yeah, Thank you, Sanjay, but, for your yeah. input. Uh, Raghavindra, please stand Yeah. Here. The other thing is uh, the complications of uh, interoperative neuromonitoring. Now, basically, all of us have learned over a period of time you know, about the complications which happen, especially when you are monitoring the motor evoked potentials. Uh, you have to be very careful that you have protected the teeth and the tongue, the lips of the patient during the, you know, 
during the surgery. Uh, most of us would have had, by experience, you know, plans to mitigate all this uh, because this this is something which can uh, can be a nasty thing, which you will re uh, recognize only at the end of the procedure. As Dr. Sanjay was telling, if the procedure was done in the prone position, you would never get to know till you have turned the patient. It is something which, yes. you know, uh, which would be very unpleasant for us. We had a lot of, uh, you know, as a part of our learning curve. Uh, these days, we are uh, using, uh, you know, even our technicians know, and uh, we use uh, gauze rolled, which is kept between the teeth to prevent, uh, you know, the biting. Uh, of the tongue or the lips or the you know cheek which can happen so you know those are the things uh, uh, which are important at the same time these uh, bite blocks whatever you might call uh, should not drop out of the patient when you position them prone now, that yeah. is another practical thing you know which is very important uh, all in all uh, the practice of anesthesia itself has to be altered to allow intraoperative neuromonitoring. Uh, I would say when you are doing electrocorticography, uh, the, you would be surprised. You would have to keep the patient very light to get good recordings. So especially for, say, epilepsy surgeries, uh, your patient has to be, you know, just about, uh, you know, of course, after the availability of uh, dexmedomidine, uh, most of us have been using it generously, uh, especially when, uh, you know, uh, along with opioids, because most of the drugs interfere with the, the microelectrode recording or the electrocorticography. Right. So, you know, that is another thing uh, uh, which is a, a challenge uh, during the intraoperative neuromonitoring. Right. Uh, there are, uh, yeah, yeah, please continue. Uh, there are a few things, uh, my observations. I would, uh, uh, people might be surprised. Uh, the first talk on ICP. Yeah. Uh, normally, we think that uh, the ICP can go up if the blood pressure goes up. But ICP, you know, can go up even during, and one of the uh, is hypertension. So, for, you know, when you are worried, when you are managing a patient with, uh, who has features of raised ICP, hypertension uh, can worsen uh, uh, the uh, rise in the ICP. Another thing as, a, as an observation, the autoregulatory uh, range, what was mentioned, is for a person with normal blood pressures. And obviously, there is change when, uh, you know, the person is a hypertensive. And uh, these days, uh, hypertension is so common. And uh, especially patients who come with complications because of hypertension having raised ICPs is so common that, uh, you know, th this has to be kept in mind. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Autoregulatory uh, limits are... Um, uh, limits are different for different, uh, hypertension. Different in hypertension. And also that there is... Uh, in cardiac surgery, there's always uh, statements made that uh, patients who are long-standing diabetes and hypertension and patients whom we give uh, vasodilators, these vasodilators may impair the autoregulation and the limits uh, of autoregulation in such patients. It's difficult to go by what have based on the usual textbook recommendations. Yes. So here uh, they have said that uh, we can take the aid of uh, cerebral oximeters. Yes, sir. So, so you, if the arterial pressure, the given pressure, the oximeter is maintained, probably the autoregulation is okay at that point of time. Dr. Belani, would you like to comment on the presentations or if you want to add anything? Sure, this was an excellent session today. Yes. All the speakers did a fabulous job. Uh, I had a few mm -hmm. comments. One is, when you do spine surgery, are they using in India a continuous infusion of lidocaine and ketamine in low dose, mainly to help with post-operative pain recovery? We find that we can get them off uh, 
most of the opioids afterwards and PONV risk is lower. And it's been described in the orthopedic literature. That's the way they tend to do them in the United States. So we are using in our spine cases a very low dose infusion of uh, lidocaine and ketamine. And of course, along with opioids and like, like was mentioned, that the anesthetic level should be just reasonable to overcome the discomfort of the procedure. And for that, BIS monitoring is what we use. Uh, we don't call it the depth of anesthesia monitor because those monitors are actually monitors of sedation, not of depth of anesthesia, because that has been disproven. They don't actually monitor depth of anesthesia. They are monitoring the pharmacological effects of the agents we are using. So they should be called uh, sedation level monitors. So I just want to know if that's what they are. Are they using these infusions in India or not? And uh, the other thing is it might be worthwhile doing a multi-center study in India where we can compare the EEG, uh, you know, the full, you know, 16, 20 lead monitoring with, with the nears in the brain when they're yeah. doing carotid endarterectomy surgery to show that NERS is, is a good, uh, uh, you know, uh, monitor when compared to the complete EEG monitoring. So if, if a few centers in India could combine and do this uh, study, that will be great to show that the NERS is as good and compares favorably with the multi, you know, lead e, the actual EEG monitoring, which we do at our place right now uh, when we do carotid endarterectomy. Thank you. Uh, Thank you our, so much. Yes, yes. In our, yes, sir. In our center, we are uh, not yet started using ketamine uh, um, to re for uh, analgesia and uh, reduced uh, um, locks with uh, ketamine as of now yet, sir. Um, we are just using propofol and dexmed infusion along with fentanyl boluses. Yeah, so... Yeah, we find that this low-dose lidocaine and ketamine seems to be helpful. And our, new, and our uh, spine surgeons, you know, they hear a lot about it at their meetings. And and we found it to be quite helpful. And PONV risk is lower and pain management is quite good afterwards. You can get them off on, on the fentanyl reasonably quickly. You know, whatever opioid you're using, Sufenta and fentanyl are the two optimal choices. Right. Uh, what dose of uh, ketamine? It's one it's milligram per kilo per hour. Okay. Now, one of the advantages of, of uh, using ketamine is it enhances the intraoperative neuromonitoring. You get better amplitudes of the SSCP uh, if you're using ketamine during intraoperative neuromonitoring. Right. Of course, uh, uh, I mean, these are all, uh, you know, uh, changes which I think will slowly happen uh, using, uh, you know, drugs like uh, uh, ketamine. Uh, yeah. the, nice, the other ways, nice. other ways, the surgeons these days do minimally invasive surgeries, which actually reduces the postoperative pain. So, That's correct. And yes. uh, of course, the use of ketamine, you know, I can straight away think of when we do extensive open surgeries, uh, which can be very, very painful. So, you know, for those, we are actually putting uh, epidural catheters uh, to manage, especially multi-level multi fusions uh, and, and open surgeries. Yeah, what we do for our spines, uh, which are bigger operations like if you have the thoracic and lumbar uh, the at the end of the uh, surgery we put intrathecal morphine directly so that they are comfortable for a few days and that seems to help the other thing that you brought up which i liked was this uh, preventing the mouth injuries when they're using motor evoke potentials so we do have these pre-manufactured uh, you know, gauze pieces that are rolled up and pretty good to install and in, yeah. insert. They're quite long. And we make a, a concerted effort to put one on each side between the molars 
And in addition to that, we also have another byte block that we put in the middle. So I think this is another thing that if somebody is eager to make a special mouth block and prototype it, uh, that'll be a good thing to come up uh, and made in India product uh, to promote even Modi's efforts will be a good idea. So if y'all can design one, uh, that'll be nice because it's much needed and there are different companies making different types of blocks, but there's, a, there's room for improvement and also having one that's uh, economical. Thank you, Vilani. It was very useful to have you. You have already given us three research proposals. Right. One of the use of uh, the EEG for um, the rotary gendratectomy, then the ketamine infusions, and now the bite block. Thank you so much. It was so useful to have you here. Uh, can I go through two of the questions which are there on the chat box? Uh, first one, which I can see is that uh, what is the legality of MEP or SACP reading? I, I think Hindumati will you bring uh, uh, yes, uh, is I mean, I mean, I don't think it is legal, uh, legally mandatory for an anesthesiologist to know MEP or SACP because there right. is usually an electrophysiologist. A uh, technician who is an uh, expert in the electrophysiology who will be monitoring the uh, uh, new, you know, interoperative nerve monitoring. And as uh, anesthesiologists, we need not have to know it, all the intricacies of this. That's what I feel. Right, right. The, the other question is how frequently you change the NIRS electrode in case you are doing continuous NIRS monitoring in ICU? This can be answered by Indumati, Dr. Badri, or um, Raghavendra Pai, maybe in that sequence. And then, of course, Balani, Dr. Um, this uh, occasion only we, I have used, sir. Uh, uh, not uh, in uh, everyday IONM. So uh, for the full case, one electrode we use. So post-operatively, right. not much use. Uh, um, I have not used it much. You don't use it, no. Dr. Badri, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, we routinely use uh, BIS or entropy for uh, monitoring is planned because we always have to have an infusion. It's very uh, useful. The question to is us. in ICU. ICU is the question relates to use of units in ICU. We don't routinely monitor uh, BIS yeah. or uh, entropy in the ICU. Raghavendra? Uh, I, I would tell this. We don't monitor. Uh, uh, no, using BIS. I think the question is about NIRS. NIRS, NIRS. NIRS. Okay. not BIS. It's okay. NIRS. So, uh, I think Dr. Murali must be knowing because he's using... Uh... See, we, we can use NIRS in uh, aortic surgeries just to see that the both sides of the brain are getting perfused. Sometimes when we are doing the anti-grade cerebral perfusion from the right side, we expect that the left side also get perfused, but the circle of willis may not be efficient in some patients. So even if you are perfusing once from the right side in patients who have the aortic heart surgery is done in deep circulatory arrest, when the heart of aorta is open, uh, we think that if you put blood into the right side, it will go to the left side, but it's not invariable. Uh, in, uh, so we need to monitor both sides of the brain using NIRS. And if the left side brain desaturates, we promptly put a cannula in the left side at a common carotid artery and then perfuse that brain. That is the most important use of NIRS in aortic heart surgeries as far as cardiac surgery is concerned. The question here is continuous NIRS monitoring in ICU. Raghavendra, do you want to say anything about this? Uh, we we are not you, using. You said about this. It. Yeah, yeah. You said about it. We're not. But the uh, thing is, the you know, the uh, as the time goes, say longer than a day, you know, you might require to change the sensor. Right, right. So it'll add to the expense. Uh, to the, that cost is another the, thing which it cost to the patient. Right. So the re and the reliability also comes down. You know, when the contact. And uh, in some of our patients, you know, who are really bad, if they have autonomic dysfunction, you know, if they start sweating, 
uh, yes. you know that is another thing which can interfere with uh, continuous uh, nurse monitoring so right. these are the technical uh, you know issues in the icu but if you are monitoring say uh, if you have used it intraoperative you can continue for at least 24 hours in the icu i think so i think so and also we use it in patients who are in ecmo especially in the veno arterial ecmo when you use the peripheral cannulations for example, you put the arterial cannula in the femoral artery and oxygenated blood is being pumped into the femoral artery. As the heart uh, function improves, heart starts to eject blood. And if the lungs are not optimally ventilated or lungs are not functioning optimally, the heart will eject uh, relatively deoxygenated blood will be ascending the proximal ascending aorta. So there will be what is called as the north south syndrome. That is, the upper body gets deoxygenated blood, whereas the lower body gets good oxygenated blood. So this can be detected by the use of NIRS. Uh, and also, if we can use it if we're putting in the cough muscle to look at the tissue perfusion, how the perfusion of the tissue is occurring in ICU situation. Now, I'll request Dr. Bellani to say something about use of NIRS in ICU. Yeah, the, we, we use the nerves and we leave it on in the ICU. Uh, particularly, I'm, I'm in the pediatric ICU that I'm familiar with. Uh, so we, we we use it all the time continuously uh, till they are discharged uh, fully awake and alert before we discontinue the monitoring. And so that's pretty routine in our institution. And for all cardiac cases, it's always monitored throughout the cardiac surgery and also postoperatively. Yes. One more question which you may tackle. What is the dose of xylocaine and ketamine you advocate? Uh, regarding ketamine, you already said about 1 milligram per kg per hour. How about xylocaine? Same thing. It's about 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilo per hour. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. One other question is on uh, optic nerve diameter. Is the ICP reliable? Uh we are in uh, some cases like steep head low still we are using sir optic uh, disc uh, diameter but um, 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 it is uh, reliable i feel i'm not I, very I, sure i think so i think it's being extensively used in uh, intensive care units to determine the icp and i think it is reliable uh, anybody else would like to say anything uh, on this issue I think it is related. So we'll be able to follow the trends of the ICP, but to right. not give any values. <laughs> uh, you can't compare it with an invasive monitor where you get uh, actual values based on which you can manage treatment. And it also is uh, operator dependent to a certain extent. That is true. Uh, some bit of training is needed, and if the diameter is going up, probably can say that ICP is also going up. It is Next basically question. Like a, yeah. Yes, yes, Ravindra. Basically a trend yes. monitor rather than a single value. Right. The next question is, can we use ketamine in patients with probably increased ICP is the question. Can we use ketamine in patients who have increased ICP? Textbooks oh. say that don't use <laughs> ketamine in patients who have increased ICP. So, yeah. what's your take on this, Dr. Bellani, Raghavindra, Badri, Sanjay? Uh, what I would say yes. is, it is the worry is in only those patients who have already gone into that decompensated state. Patients, right. yeah. so th there is no question of using ketamine in those patients. Other than that, there should not be any reason for anybody to use ketamine. Of course, you, the, the reason most often when ketamine is used, you would be using it as an infusion rather than a bolus, which is more likely to cause problems. It is an indirect effect of ketamine. It is not that it directly increases the, uh, the blood pressures. But when you are using it only for its analgesic property, which is a very small dose, yes. I don't think there will be any effect on the ICP at all. No, I, I fact, agree with you. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, if you're preventing a noxious stimulus being blunted by the use of ketamine, definitely it would be much more beneficial uh, 
using ketamine rather than not using it. Dr. Bellani, what is your response on this? Yeah, I, I don't have much experience with it, but we generally would avoid its use, mainly because of the literature. Another area for, for good uh, research, if somebody can do it, where they have an ICP monitor in place, and then you see whether the low-dose ketamine makes any change. I know I've done some cases where they actually have an LP in you know, monitoring pressure, opening pressure and closing pressure in children. Yeah. And uh, in those cases, we have sometimes used ketamine and, uh, and a small dose of ketamine has not shown any change in the, in the pressure in the CSF when the LP was done. And so uh, I think in low doses, it's probably okay. And I think the studies which are quoted in the textbooks to show that it increases ICP are related more to a larger dose. And uh, it maybe it has some effects on the cerebral vasculature where it uh, might be dilating the vessels because, because in the higher doses, if you see the effects on the vasculature, it's actually a vasodilator transiently and that can cause an ICP rise. So I think it's controversial. But uh, another room for some more studies in this regard. What about uh, this uh, concern regarding behavioral disturbances, emergence delirium with the use of uh, ketamine? Well, uh, the thing is, most of the patients we use it on would already have uh, been receiving either propofol or they'd be receiving midazolam and other sedatives, dexmedetomidine. Those all will obtain. The, uh, the unwanted uh, excitatory effects in the brain. But uh, and those, are those are seen where you have used um, only ketamine and you have shown that when they wake up, they have these excitatory effects. But when you're using it as a low dose and when you're using it for pain control and you're using other drugs with it, and especially if you pre-treated them with benzodiazepines, you don't see that much of an effect on the uh, excitatory things. Ketamine has been used these days for refractory depression. Small doses uh, because of the changes, you know, uh, it's an MDA receptor antagonist and uh, using small doses, definitely it would be beneficial, uh, you know, if you are worried about uh, you know, having an agitated patient at the end of the uh, surgery. Some amount of euphoria can happen because of uh, ketamine. I think uh, using it judiciously would definitely be beneficial. In, uh, yeah. Yeah, for emergent surgery. agitation, even in children, when you use a show and you're doing a short procedure and they wake up and they, are, and they have emergence agitation, a small dose of ketamine will fix it. So, you know, it has some uh, good beneficial effects. It's all related to dose and whether there are concomitant other medicines being used. All right. Uh, I see Dr. Radha Krishnan. Can I ask, request Dr. Radha Krishnan to comment or um, add any points? Dr. Dr. Radha Krishnan? Dr. Radha Krishnan. Um, now, I think uh, we have answered all the questions which are there. And thank you for that excellent discussion. And uh, before we conclude, I request Dr. Jayashri Sood. Uh, would, would you like to make any comment? Or, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, you had a very, thank very you for joining uh, us interesting and very uh, detailed discussion on this topic and thank you so much to everyone and of course officially you will be giving the vote of thanks Is it so? <laughs> i did want to say that yes we also use motor evoked potentials for our spine surgery regularly and um, as far as the ketamine infusion yes we've used it in a few cases but uh, as rightly said by the other experts, maybe it's still not very, very commonly used. So that's all that I have to say. Thank you so much. And uh, 
Dr. Kanji, please do the official vote of thanks. Sure, sure. Dr. Radha Krishnan, are you there? Sorry? Uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan, uh, his name is shown up, so I thought he's there. Anyway, I would like to thank uh, the ICA uh, in particular for the excellent opportunity provided to all of us by providing us the platform for scientific exchange. It's very well being done very well. Thank you so much, Dr. Jayashri and Sanish, Dr. Radha Krishnan, Baljit, Dr. Belani as well. So thank you so much. I think it's a very good uh, yeah, event. Uh, and uh, the three speakers have done very well. Amit, Sweta, and Indumati, all of have done very well. And I, I will particularly thank Dr. Badrinath, Raghavendra, and Sanjay for having been with us uh, to shed light and uh, ex uh, I mean, they share their experiences in this uh, uh, topic called issues in neuroanesthesia. I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Sunil Poboni, who was there. I think he's not, not there anymore. Dr. Jayashri Sud and Dr. Radhakshan for joining us and all the participants who, who have been listening to our uh, session. Thank you so much. And we'll meet again next Wednesday for another topic on the same platform, same time. Thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank, thank you. you so much.